But what's new and exciting is The Economist really never talked about adaptivity in the data that much. We have econometrics, which measures the economy and tries to say, was well, the GDP going up or down or whatever? But what's really exciting is mechanism design and contracts and auctions and interactions between people, recommendation systems brought it into economic decisions where what I do depends on what you've done and data is being shared and, and decisions are being made based on up, updated data. How do you imagine that Amazon can sell a billion products to hundreds of millions of people? There's no human being that could ever work out the logistics that are needed to do that. That's all been done by machine learning, you know? So Amazon, in fact, the, the advent of the cloud, cloud computing didn't just arise because Amazon thought we should put lots of computers out there and let people use them. It instead arose because Amazon had lots of computers because it was all doing machine learning on logistics data, supply chain data, and then eventually on kind of commerce data. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I speak to Michael Jordan, not the basketball legend, but Michael I. Jordan, a towering figure in the world of AI. Michael is co-author of the book, Machine Learning, A Probabilistic Perspective, which is a standard textbook in the field. We spoke about his perspective on deep learning Deep Learning Statistical Foundation, and his interest in networks. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist, and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins, everything you need, all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI. E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. They support us, so let's support them. It's my pleasure to be joining you. I'm Mike Jordan from University of California, Berkeley. I've been working in machine learning for roughly 30 years and continue to be very engaged and active. Yeah. You started in deep learning, or at least you were involved in deep learning some years ago. And then from what I've read and heard, you've become a critic of deep learning and uh, have spent your time more in, in statistics and other forms of machine learning that, that don't rely on neural nets. Is that right? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so I'm definitely not a critic of deep learning. It's gradient descent and it fits data and generalizes in high dimensional spaces. That's all for the good. And I would also debate, it is a statistical technique. It, 
you analyze it with statistics. You say, how well it, will it generalize? That's a question of statistics. There's an unknown distribution out in the world, which is generating future data. And you'd like to estimate how well you'll do relative to that. You'd also like to put uncertainty quantification around your deep neural net, which is an active area. I'm engaged in that. So it's all to the good. It's just the deep learning it itself doesn't solve all problems. And in fact, it's, it's, it's a one tool in the toolbox. It's as if you were a civil engineer and you said, I've got a hammer that solves all problems. It's a very good thing, a hammer. And so my, my critique is more about the casting of the overall bigger problem. It's definitely not a critique about deep learning. And I definitely don't see it. Uh, it, it is statistical and uh, it should be analyzed with statistics. It has a statistical foundation. And so there's no conflict whatsoever of deep learning and, a st and statistical thinking. How do you see the current trend in deep learning fitting into the larger progress of machine learning or AI. And as I mentioned, I'm particularly interested, as everyone is right now, in, in the development of large language models and the multimodality of large models and the increasing generalization of these models. Is that a direction that will begin to draw on these other kinds of AI? There, there's not another way to do language right now. The language is about understanding and semantics and meaning. And when we're conversing, that's what really matters. But just like vision, there's also lots of low order correlations, small changes in, in inputs that are interesting, but are not the major communicative issue. And uh, naive methods focus too much on all the little stuff. Again, for visual scenes, it's kind of obvious. If I look at a visual scene, there's all kinds of stuff in it, all the pixels. And most of those pixels don't matter. And naive methods pick up on most of the stuff that doesn't matter and get lost. And so the deep learning technology has been able to focus down on some of the stuff that matters in the scene. Uh, and so think of it as kind of poor man's semantics. It captures all kinds of little correlations that most of us are not aware of or don't even really care about. And some of them are interesting, but it's still poor man's semantics. It's not doing human level abstraction, human level reasoning, human level kind of what if experiments in our head, planning over long stretches of times, pulling together diverse kinds of knowledge. It's not doing that stuff. And uh, does that mean it will never do that stuff? No, I wouldn't say that. It's just that it's a platform. It's a tool that allows you to get started. So instead of having to focus on all the little details, uh, what classical AI would have sort of started with all the little details and tried to build an edifice on top of that, it just says learning will kind of handle a lot of those things and you don't have to worry about them. You, you can now start to build abstractions of very, various kinds on top of, of this. And so I think that's the way to think about it if your focus is language. And you should you should be impressed or wowed by accomplishments, the surprising things that come out that seem a little bit like a, a hint of semantics or a hint of reasoning. Well, that suggests that it may not be as terribly hard as we all thought it was because human knowledge is so rich and every little thing seems to matter little subtleties in what words we choose and how we place them and how we string together arguments and all that. So some of that can just be picked up in, in the statistics of billions of words. It's not how humans learn with gradient descent on billions of words, but you know, it gives a, a platform for building more things that are more human, like on top of that, and starting to lead to things that are even more surprising and look more and more like understanding of semantics. When I say semantics, it's not even a technical term. It's just, as you and I are conversing, we both starting to build up a model in our head of what we're talking about. And it may be things in the world. It might be events. It might be social relationships. It might be philosophical issues. It might be emotional things. But we start to build up a, a model of things that we're talking about, and we communicate around that model. And so if I'll say something in 20 minutes, it'll be in the context of, of not just the string of words I've uttered, but the model that you and I have built up based on our commonalities. And 
and so we're we're very far away from doing that kind of thing with computers just to say it doesn't mean that it's impossible that we won't start to get there but we're very far away from that and so you know that deep learning should be thought of in context of one step towards a much much more complex problem that wasn't being solved before at all and maybe this is a glimmer of a path forward but it just gradient descent on large amounts of data uh, to me is not the answer uh, it, no. it's an engineering discipline also and it's thinking about what are the structures and what are the things that we need and it's not classical ai and it's not just gradient descent it, it's more and so there's open research questions there but the other part is that uh, lang large language models and large visual models and all that, that generate interesting looking things it's a palette you can now do it to use it to do creative things just like artists were had new kind of technology available to them in the past and they use them creatively modest amounts of businesses business plans can be built on some aspects of this so it's you know it's all to the good um but again it's a small part of a bigger much bigger kind of set of issues it's pattern recognition it's finding correlations and high order correlations in large amounts of data and hopefully generalizing from one day to the next i should say i don't think that's really being done particularly well there's lots and lots of distribution shift issues which are very much the real problem in real life because things change all the time that these methods are still quite poor at they're also quite poor at uncertainty quantification and reasoning about uncertainty. they're they're poor at causal reasoning and what if experiments and when we start thinking about hard decisions we start doing what if experiments in our head and uh, they don't do that particularly well and so on and so forth so this isn't a critique fundamentally it's just that these are the open research questions these aren't the ones that are solved by just running gradient descent on vast amounts of data and so there's a little naivete i think that you see people that are wowed by billion parameter models and billion parameter things just that you can do it is pretty interesting and that surprising stuff comes out is pretty interesting but that's that we should tamp down a little bit of that wow experience and realize that this is a hard field to, to make progress in and, the, and most of the challenges are still ahead yeah and the other part is kind of what field is this this is this imitate humans because if you think about natural language that's the obvious goal is that i could do the turing test i could talk with a human and i'm a computer and it would be just as good as a human talking and it would understand a lot of the richness and subtleties of language and so on and so forth and yes that's a great question right a great aspiration or goal in the 1940s and 50s it was very natural to ask this question can you do this because there wasn't really computers before that the whole notion that we have hardware and software it looks a little bit like mind and brain and that maybe just algorithmic rules can do things like language was for grabs and it was exciting to be able to take a philosophical question and turn it into a almost a, an algorithmic or mathematical question and so a lot of people including in my generation were raised on that that if you can imitate humans and natural language is probably the key venue in which you should be exploring that then that's a you know fantastic intellectual achievement by humans true and we still haven't really achieved that we don't have machines that understand and reason remotely close to what humans do but on the other hand it's not the necessarily the real problem it, to imitate a human you can ask about well if i could imitate a human what would i do with that and you see a lot of people who are ai people scrambling around and sort of say well it'll do this and that it'll but most of the things it'll do are low level replacing lots of jobs like call centers or robotics kind of things and and in the meantime computers are being used for all kinds of things financial markets transportation systems commerce education all kinds of network kind of phenomena are arising healthcare that are being labeled as kind of technology ai technology but they're very now we're very far away from the original vision of replacing a human or, or substituting a computer the skills of a computer are those of a human 
And we have billions of humans. Having a few more is not going to necessarily change anything. And so then the goal becomes, well, it's going to be better than humans. Now you're kind of off into science fiction. And so I'd like to think about what are the current problems? And to me, they're, they're, they're more in the network. They're more in the economy. They're, when I say economy, I mean the, the, you know, the network. The, yeah. uh, if you and I are interacting on a computer, or maybe you're a computer, or maybe I'm not, and maybe there's thousands of us or millions of us, we're all interacting. There's got to be principles that get, govern those interactions. And a lot of them are, are not going to be just logic and language. A lot of them will be economic. What do you, how, what's your value on this? What do you, what can you tell me? What do you want to tell me? How are you, what are our incentives to interact? And uh, how do, how's that all the condition my data? How does that flow forward over time? How does the change in conditions reflected in that overall system? And AI people, just for the most part, not everybody, just don't think this way. They don't think about the overall bigger network and system. Uh, and think of that's the goal is to study that and to th study the principles of that. Yeah. Um, it, it's not just the AI goal of putting intelligence in a computer. Yeah. To me, AI is there's one of the goals is to create uh, systems or computer systems that optimize existing systems beyond what humans are capable of doing. And then part of that is is making, or maybe an offshoot of that is making a decision based on that optimization or getting to that optimization that maybe the variables or the data is too great for a human to be able to manage intellectually an AI system could make a decision based on a much broader field of data than a human could and make a decision that is quote unquote correct and then there there's building a cognitive model and i, I think you did some work on that when you were at mit at the brain and cognitive sciences department and from there then there's the question of whether you can uh, build a system that does reason. Uh, and I know that, that there's a lot more going on than those three buckets, but that's the way I think about it. Like optimization on a very grand scale, you have Russia and Ukraine, for example. There, there are competing goals and desires. Presumably, if you took all of the variables and threw them into a, a, a system that uh, could optimize perfectly, it would come up with a solution between those two states that would satisfy everybody, or at least come close to satisfying everybody. And then uh, if there's, if you have a system that is allowed to have a certain amount of autonomy, it could make a decision based on that optimization. Can we talk about that first? And then I wanted to talk about cognitive models and reasoning. There was a fascinating talk at NeurIPS by a guy named David Chalmers, you probably know him, about the possibility that large language models could develop some form of reasoning and low-level consciousness. But on the optimization and decision-making, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, probably more than you want to hear. I don't, yeah, I, I have a very different perspective than the one you're alluding to. I really, economics people have talked about these kind of things a lot. It, it's kind of, when you say the word system, I think you keep referring to system as a computer, as the operating system that does something, or the system that we, the cognitive model that we put in a box and it does something as a, it makes a decision. And really the system should be thought of as like a whole network and an economy. The system that brings food into New York every day, if you didn't know any better, if you're sitting on Mars looking at the earth, you'd say, wow, there's something really intelligent going on there. And it's composed of many parts, which apparently are these little individuals 
deciding whether to bring carrots from one side of a city or to the other or not, or whether to supply wheat or bake things. or it, It's all these kind of things happening. And what happens at the end of it, the output of all that is that people eat, that several millions of people every day have the food they need. And it happens day in and day out for long times. That's amazingly intelligent, that system. All right? Yep. And that is a system. And it has its principles. And a lot of them are not optimization principles. In fact, most of them are not optimization, really. They're like equilibria finding and Pareto uh, equilibrium that we can't exactly have what we want, but we'll trade off this and that. We'll price it. They're also, look, I'd like to, I'm your boss and I'd like to get you to do something, but I don't know like how much, how, how sick you are or not. You're not going to tell me. Or I want to get people to pay for something like health insurance, right? That I don't know how, how sick they are, how willing they are. And so I don't know how to price that. And they're not going to tell me. So I've got to then develop a system of incentives that is responsive to that situation of asymmetric information, missing information. Information is not just available. And so when you talk about Ukraine and, and Russia, a lot of information is just not available. It can't be. It's impossible to consider an optimization. That's, a, that's science fiction. It's not even science fiction. It's just not going to happen. It's unrealistic. And so what do we do as human beings that we can't even conceive of optimizing? We find equilibria. We set up incentives so that even I don't know what, I know that I've incentivized you to behave in a certain way. And that'll, and I, that'll hopefully lead to more of a satisfying equilibrium that we arrive at. All right. Now, the economists didn't you know, sort of solve all these problems, but they talked about it. And uh, with all due respect to computer science and philosophers, they missed some of this economics discussion. And uh, they bring in the fairness issues. Am I being treated fairly? And really, it's about this overall system. But what's new and exciting is the economists really never talked about adaptivity in the data that much. We have econometrics, which measures the economy and tries to say, was well, the GDP going up or down or whatever? But what's really exciting is mechanism design and contracts and auctions and interactions between people, recommendation systems brought in into economic decisions where what I do depends on what you've done and data is being shared and, uh, and decisions are being made based on up updated data. It's not even a decision you can localize in a, you know, a single quote unquote system. It's the overall system. The air traffic control system is making decisions all the time that are reasonably intelligent, more and more. And uh, the economy is making decisions all the time at all kinds of levels. And so just this way of talking and thinking, it, it just wasn't present in what you were saying. And this notion that there's the technology of optimization on the one hand, and then there's the human cognitive thing on the other hand, to me, just missing the entire picture of what real computer science is being used for. Our cell phones give us co compute power. They network with each other. We create value. We're producers and consumers of various things. We do that over time. We interact. We learn about outcomes. If you had a nice experience in a restaurant, I learn about that and so on. That changes the economy. It's a whole big closed loop system. And this is going to take a long time to work out. But to me, this is the problem of the era. And with all due respect to cognitive modeling and thinking about the philosophy of consciousness and all that, wonderful things to work on too, in parallel. It'll take a couple hundred years in, for each of these things. But one does not depend on the other at all. And what I'm talking about is, is just, I think the pro problem is you go to Europe, she'll hardly hear anything about it. <laughs> it's yeah. all on, do we have intelligence and consciousness in the classical AI sense? And so that's what exercises me is the kind of, Lack of understanding of the real world implications of these throwing compute and AI out there in the world and uh, hoping our systems perform well and do the right things. And, and they're not, you know, for, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of problems. This happens in any engineering discipline. Now, if you're into the deep neural nets thoroughly, this is the, you're excited about the potentials here that it maybe starts to do some reasoning or something like that. Again, that feels a little science fiction-y to me, frankly, but, but I do believe new things will happen. It's not just that we're going to take our current economic systems, our current transportation systems, our commerce systems, and just add some data, and it'll be a little bit better. No, it's going to be new things will happen. That's what really any sufficiently powered technology does, is that creates 
new possibilities, new ways to interact. Like I say, the economics models didn't have a lot of learning or data in them. You throw that in there, it's going to be brand new kind of markets will arise and brand, brand new ways of interact. And like I said, the deep neural nets, one of the things that they look like a bit of a toy sometimes, that's good because humans like toys. We can create new kinds of entertainment, new kinds of art can arise, but it's going to often involve humans directly. The, the idea that an autonomous entity there sitting there in a box with wires is going to do things that are artistic all by itself. Maybe not. I don't really care, frankly. I, I What I care is the next Mozart can come along and make use of all these technology and do something amazing because the Mozart's got emotions and Mozart can speak to me and so on. So anyway, I hope that it, what I really wanted to convey there is that there is an economics perspective on the system, which includes all the interactions of huge numbers of individuals, be they computers or, or, or humans, that is really the focus of what we're, what I think we're most responsible for doing right now in this era. Yeah. In, in looking at systems from that much, much broader heterogeneous perspective, how do you, how does machine learning play a role in that? Take logistics right now. There's supply yeah. chain disruptions yeah. all over. If my sort of science fiction vision is there's this this AI that that can pick up all of the different data points in the supply chain and see where the problems are and how to resolve them or how to reach that equilibrium that you're talking about. Okay, that's not an equilibrium. Now we're talking about a limited problem, which is more about how do you get goods from one place to another. And you can start talking about optimization because you can measure everything and there's not adversary, there's not strategic aspects of it. But, but you just got to understand that that's our, what you just said already was happening in the 1990s and certainly into the 2000s. How do you imagine that Amazon can sell a billion products to hundreds of millions of people? There's no human being that could ever work out the logistics that are needed to do that. That's all been done by machine learning. You know, so yeah. Amazon, in fact, the, the advent of the cloud Cloud computing didn't just arise because Amazon thought we should put lots of computers out there and let people use them. It instead arose because Amazon had lots of computers because it was all doing machine learning on logistics data, supply chain data, and then eventually on kind of commerce data, on the human facing side, and then recommendation systems, which had to do with human choices. Their compute systems were built circa, or circa 2000, let's say, to do these large scale supply chains. And indeed they would measure, there's now a strike in China or there's a, a weather event in the South Indian Sea and that's gonna affect these ships and then so on. That was all done with machine learning. And so we would have never had Amazon or Alibaba or whatever without that. And so it's already happened. And the question is, can it be better? And the answer is definitely yes. That. Uh, I mean, first of all, the supply chains we have now are amazingly rich and complex. It's a huge accomplishment that people don't really talk about so much. But 50 years ago, people have been super jealous that such things are possible. But you know, they could be more uh, abstraction oriented. They could take into account strategic aspects of it. They could do some of the bargaining that humans do between themselves. They could uh, have auctions like you have in search engines. They could do uh, much more. And they will. That's an ongoing thing. But that is what a, a company that takes products all the way out to people does in the modern world. And again, it's not so sexy that you'll see lots of articles about it in the New York Times, but it's been missed that it really already happened. So the cloud, just to finish that thought, at circa 2000, Amazon built all these computers to do all their internal data processing of logistics chains and then commerce. And at some point they realized, hey, this is really working well for us. We can run our data analysis on 10,000 computers and do a really good prediction of the logistics chain. Why don't we let other people start to use our computers too? Because we're able to scale it arbitrarily. And that thought was that that was the cloud. And so the cloud emerged from machine learning. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it, I thought it's the other way around, but no, it's not. The, the history is that it emerged from the machine learning workloads.
And how do you apply something like the Amazon system to to a a non proprietary supply chain where you have actors all over and there's no sort of central authority that's going to be managing it. Do you, do you... So now those are starting to get to be really interesting questions. I think we're now on the material I'm most interested in. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, forget the specifics of Amazon supply chain. That's going to be internal to a company. But yeah. think about healthcare. Yeah. Um, healthcare is a big supply chain, if you will. There's all kinds of, obviously, the drugs or the needs for surgery the supplies that you need to run a hospital and all that. But there's also the supply of knowledge about genomes and tumors and treatments and all that. And those could be thought of as internal and proprietary. And in some ways they have been for much of history, um, but that's changing. The, the pandemic really helped a lot that people are revealing, uh, hospitals are passing lots of data among themselves. Doctors have up-to-the-date predictions of treatments clinical trials are, are being more adaptive and that overall system is now responding to the availability of machine learning and it's led now to this emergence of what's called personalized medicine where you go in and they analyze your body in that moment in the context of all the other human bodies that have been measured in the last few years in the context of all the treatments that have been tried and that all system starts to make better predictions and then hopefully help you with better decisions. I don't think it'll autonomously make the decisions, but that overall system will feed that information through a doctor to you. And, it, and it's a big supply chain of information as well as all the products that are needed that allows us all collectively on the planet to be more healthy. And even though we're pretty healthy now, way more than in past history, the pandemic shows us how unhealthy we really are in some sense. Millions of us died. And looking back, one could have done it much better. And a lot of the solutions there are like machine learning systems thinking and hidden information thinking, incentives kind of thinking. And some of it is just old-fashioned politics and, or legal barriers that prevent people from sharing. But some of those are also based on lack of information. I don't know what the consequences will be. If I give out some data, maybe I'll get, I'll get thrown in jail or something. So working out the overall system, which now will start to include legal people and medical people and uh, you know, advocates of all, you know, stakeholders of all kinds, that's the modern technology. That's, those are the issues to focus on. And it's not just a one company will do that. It won't be locked up inside a you know, proprietary company. It'll be an overall societal effort. And so the supply chain knowledge we have from a company like Amazon, it's already clear. A lot of that is actually fairly open. And in fact, a lot of their methodology was, has been brought to the fore, like in SageMaker and the other platforms that these companies have built, because they can't, if they keep it bottled up, they don't have a very good business model. They need to make it open source so people will actually buy it and use it. And so it's, there's not that, there's not that many huge secrets stuck inside the detailed data, maybe, but it really is not a just locked up in the company. And people that work in these fields are very much aware of this. People in healthcare, people in commerce, people in finance, that, oh, I got all this data and oh, I've got the platforms and the algorithms. And if I get good engineers and I work hard on this, I can start to do things. You, you on healthcare and you, the, the example of my going into a, a doctor and having them take a scan or, or collect data from my current state and then relating that to all of the other people that have provided data and the various outcomes for various treatments and that sort of thing that's that's one kind of network right that that you're talking about where uh, every node is informing every other node so my, my state of health, uh, my history and treatment then and outcome would go into the pot and mm -hmm. inform everyone else. 
how do you see that being managed? Because for that to happen, don't you need a a central authority to manage that? Or is does it become, is there a network effect that, that you have all these different systems that are tied together that are learning from each other and collectively get better? I don't think anything I said required any kind of central authority. The, uh, and there's lots of federated learning methods. There, there's lots of concern about long tails. There's lots of peer-to-peer kind of methods that allow systems of all kinds to be built that mostly don't require central authorities. And again, just think about economies. The system, the technology that brings food into any city in the world, not just New York, is there's no central authority that, that runs it, certainly, and there's certainly no central authority that designed it. But there were principles that were put in place, and there were incentives created, and there was roads created because it, they, they knew that would help this overall process, and so on. So it's more of that level of thinking. And you know, central authorities are, are um, there's roles for them. Well, again, economists have talked a lot about this, a tragedy of the commons kind of issues, free riding kinds of issues. How do you structure systems so there's not the kind of negative externalities? And when you think about those new those issues in the new context of all this data flow and all these nodes kind of sharing data and um, all these competitive issues, all that, it just becomes exciting as an academic and as a person thinking about public policy, because now over the next few decades, it's all going to change. The previous systems we had for medicine, the previous markets we had for the economy, for entertainment and all, are going to have to complete, will completely evolve in this new world. And if we're smart as human beings, we'll do like, you know, previous engineering disciplines did. Civil engineering or chemical engineering will organize it as a big set of principles that allow us to think about these overall systems and allow them not just to be a big black box, but allow them to be a working, breathing system that has pieces that will have all this machine learning part inside of it is the technology, but it's not just the big black blocks solved our problems or that we created an artificial entity that solved our problems for us. It's us as kind of creators of principles that uh, figured out how to design systems that do we want. And they'll then, then, you know, the future engineers of this, this field, whatever you want to call it, We'll learn all these tools and these principles for, and then they'll go into particular domains. I need to design a education system in Southeast Asia, or I need to design a, a climate mitigation policy using adaptive measurements, whatever. Not, not, no two systems will be exactly the same. It'll be just like no two chemical factories are exactly the same. There will be an engineering process that brings these all these things together. Yeah, that's interesting. And maybe when I said central authority. I didn't mean a government or a company. But no, I didn't take mean, you to mean that, but I yeah. see you seem to imply that, yeah, there had to be a computer or an entity that would collect all this stuff and organize it. And like I say, that's just not the, most economies don't have that kind of thing happening and and you don't have to think of systems that way. And yeah, but like I say, we are all over that in our research field. Things like peer-to-peer or federated or all that already are very much focused on issues like that. Yeah. you Can you talk a little bit about your, your work in multi-agent learning and how that sure. might relate to this? Sure. Maybe just let me give an example of, I mean, there's a, I'll maybe to give a couple of examples, but one of the topics I'm real interested in right now is asymmetry of information, like I was alluding to earlier. In economics, it's something called contract theory or that's the solution methodology. And um, in our federated learning situations, we often have this model, this idea that data resides at the edge of a huge network. People have their cell phones or there's the cars. And it would be, wouldn't it be nice if you'd collect all that data centrally so you could build a huge mega model and then everyone would profit from that. That's the original vision. And for some cases, that's appropriate. For other cases, you really have to worry about the incentives. Why would anyone willingly allow their data to be sent in? And if they wouldn't allow their data to be sent in, 
can at least some of it be sent in. And now you start to talk about trade-offs. You say, well, I'm going to lose a little privacy, but maybe I'll get some benefit from that. So I like to think about things like recommendation systems for real world goods. Like I go into a brand new city, Singapore, I've never been there. It's 6 p.m. I finish my meetings and I'd like to get dinner. I'd like to be now in a system which knows something about me. I like Sichuan cuisine. I have a certain price point. I'm located in a certain location. Here's the kind of things I've tried before when I'm in, a, in Southeast Asia. Whatever. It knows some things about me, but it not know everything about me. It doesn't know lots of stuff. So it knows some limited things about me, the overall system. It takes that information then and it broadcasts it in a market that there's also on the other side of the market, there's restaurants or whatever that see me as a possible client and they see other possible clients. Maybe there's about 10,000 people in that moment with their cell phone out looking for a dinner. And that overall two-way market does a kind of a matching, but again, based on all the data that's being provided by some history. And so I now I'm glad I gave up a little privacy because suddenly on my cell phone, there's a bean for a nice restaurant that is perfect for me. And uh, it was matched to me. And it's not just that I got a search engine that gave me a long list of things or some advertisements or whatever. I got something that which actually was matched to me for good reasons. And the matching means that you're not going to send 10,000 people to the same restaurant because different people are going to have different preferences and they can get placed to other places. So I like that kind of way of thinking. It shows that privacy is just part of the trade-off, that sharing data is part of the overall system that I want to get some value out of. And so people now work on that. How do you value data? How do you think about building systems that of value data. And now in situations where like two people have the same data, should I value them equally? Should I, if I have one, is that enough? How do I pay people for supplying data? These are issues that are really touch on lots of fields, not obviously computer science, but statistics, sociology, really you know, law. And this is what excites me is to think about how to build such systems. The multi-agent learning, what role does that play in this? So let me just, so multi-agent learning is a buzzword. It just means any learning where there's multiple entities. I like to think of these entities as strategic. You're not just collecting passively from agents and they're just not willing to share. And so let me give you this exa this concrete example of the word that helped us think about contract theory a little bit. So the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, every year has got, or well, ongoing, has this problem of trying to figure out what drugs should go to market. And, but they don't develop the drugs themselves, they test the drugs. And a test costs tens of millions of dollars. It's a clinical trial. So we've seen that with the vaccines. All right, so the FDA is running a statistical test. So it's collecting data from the, the clinical trial and trying to decide whether a drug is actually good or it's actually not good not effective. A uh, big, important decision. It's, it's a statistical decision, though, because there could be false positives. It, there's data being collected. All right, so now the agents are the pharmaceutical companies, and there's a large number of them, and they're all sitting out there, and they are trying to build, uh, construct new molecules or new proteins or whatever, and they're trying to, and they test them internally and start to learn a little bit about what's promising, what's not. But at the end of the day, they're going to send some drug candidates to the FDA. And the FDA is going to test those drug candidates. And if it passes the test, they're allowed to go to market and they can make billions of dollars. So clearly they're highly motivated to send lots of candidates into the FDA. All right. Now the FDA is sitting there saying, I'm getting all these candidates and for people hoping to get false positives or, or maybe true positives. Wouldn't it be nice if I could ask those drug companies, hey, that candidate you just sent me, that's a really good candidate or not? Internally, maybe. You don't know if it's really good. You've done some internal tests. If you put your best engineers on it or not. So if you ask the drug company that, hey, is that a good candidate or not? They're not going to tell you or they're going to lie. And that's what humans do. A lot of times when we ask humans for data, if you ask me... If you're an insurance company, you ask me how much I exercise, I'm going to lie. 
And so lots of data has that strategic flavor to it in the multi-agent setting. So now the FDA is sitting there saying, okay, I can't get, I, I can't just ask them. And that, that's called, well, that's the problem of moral hazard or, or uh, adverse selection in economics language. Uh, there's people that possess information. They're not just willing to provide it and they won't provide it. And if you ask them, you push them, they'll provide you false information. Okay. So contract theory is a way to set up what are called contracts. And these are menus of options. If you pay this amount, you'll get this. If you pay this amount, you'll get this and so on. Just like when you go on the airplane, you've got business class fare and you've got economy class fare and so on. And you've got different services that allows you to effectively charge people different amounts based on their self-selection. And so contract theory is a mathematical theory of how to do that in some generality. All right. But again, it wasn't ever statistical. There was not a statistical contract theory. You didn't collect data as part of the process and do a hypothesis test. All right. So that's what we've done. We've created this statistical version of contract theory where the FDA now offers the drug companies a menu of options. If you pay this amount, I'm going to do this kind of test and you'll get this kind of outcome. You pay this amount, you'll get a different outcome and so on. And the drug company will look at that and now you set it up so they are incentivized to mostly send in their effective drugs, the ones they think are most effective. And the, now see the FDA is collecting things and they have to pay out a little bit of money. They're making bets really, but they've set it up so that most of those bets are likely to be good ones. Just like the airplane has set things up so they fill their airplane and most people are happy. And that's not being done because this problem hadn't been thought about before. But now I hope you can see that this is a very common situation. I've got lots of agents who possess private data and there's no way you're going to get that data because they're not incentivized to, to get it, to give it to you. But you'd like an overall system to run effectively by supplying some aspects of that data. And so you got to set up these options and now you're using data to inform the menu of options. So it becomes a statistical thing. Okay. That's probably a little bit of a technical description, but when you really say the word multi-agent, this is what you got to start thinking about. Strategic agents who possess things that others don't possess, it's decentralized and it has to be because people hold on to the value they have internally. They don't want their competitors to know, but they also don't want decision makers to know. And so this is leaked into the machine world, learning world. When you do things like ask people for loans when you ask a bank for loans and you're trying to use machine learning internally to assess whether to give someone a loan, when you collect data from people, if they know a little bit about the algorithm being used, it's some neural net or some logistic regression, they're going to fake their data a little bit. So they seem more likely to be loan worthy. And the system should know that a priori. And machine learning is now starting to work on this a little bit and treat, the, the, treat these as fairness issues or adversarial issues and all. But Really, a lot of these frameworks already exist if we take the more broad perspective of we're designing economic systems that have got contractual and strategic issues and valuations being made and so on. And how does data inform all those kind of issues? So I have a lot of work on that. And I would, this to me is the field of multi-agent. It's critical that the agents be strategic for me because that makes it really interesting. That makes it, there's opportunities for cooperation there's opportunities for uh, for co competition and in that view agents are human agents or not or necessarily organizations no they could they, they don't have to be any they could be all, all the above and so, so for example think about a system that we're, we're already close to like, traffic control if i want to get to the airport i plug in from here to the airport and i get the fastest route right it's the fastest route based on historical data. And in the moment, it's not clear this the fastest route. And it's getting, the, the calculations are getting better and better. But the point, the problem is that as soon as you start making this into a decision-making system, not just pattern recognition from past data, you can send lots of people down the same route. Okay, and you will create congestion and that'll show up pretty quickly other people coming will see the congestion they may avoid it but you've created a congestion yeah. okay and so these kind of smart pricing systems like you have now in some cities start to see feel like a solution so i might want to really get to the airport quickly because i got a flight that's leaving and i got someone sick i got to go see 
And so I'm willing to spend a little money or in some currency, whatever. Whereas you are, hey, I could go slowly or, hey, I wouldn't mind taking a a longer trip and see the mountains. I've never been here before, or, or I got to stop off at the pharmacy, whatever. And so there's all these human little decisions that kind of decide who gets to go the fat on a certain route and who would go maybe on other routes. It shouldn't be an arbitrary top-down centralized decision. It should be more like an economy and a market. And now who's going to, are you going to sit here in your car and actually run an auction for people to see who values the certain route the most? No way. What will happen instead is there'll be like avatars and those will be like computing systems who are like acting on your behalf. And so think of these like brokers. And uh, so they will look at the situation, gather all these bids, and they will run a little auction on your behalf, just like we have with search engines and ads. And then people will get routed and, uh, you know, it has to be verifiable and all that. But this kind of system, we're not that far away from that. But that with, with the last step that I mentioned, creating any kind of economic version of of the current data gathering systems and prediction systems is still not, we're, we don't have it yet, but I bet in 10 years we will. And the overall effect of this will be social value. You will have much better flow that we, uh, the, where this economic part gives it to you. Yeah. So yeah, the, lots of great problems of that kind that are multiple strategic agents interacting via data informed markets. Yeah, although the agent isn't learning through that interaction, it's just drawing data from the agents, right? When you think of uh, autonomous cars in in uh, in a community where all of the autonomous vehicles are communicating with each other and learning from maybe one, that's what I think of as multi-agent learning, where one car encounters some some side case in the long tail and then informs all the others about what to do in that case. That could also apply to the traffic problem. You, when you get in an autonomous yeah, I mean, car, you... I don't see the distinction. We're talking about the overall transportation problem, getting huge numbers of people from one point to another. And some of that is recognize what's happening on the street currently, and that should feed into the system. But I'm just saying on top of that should be also a who gets to go where kind of decision. Uh, if everything was literally autonomous and it was just sharing data, then you would still have the problem of you sent too many people down the same street. And you'd still have the problem of, um, moreover, you just learned the street is blocked or that some kid had just run into the street. So people shouldn't go there. That's great. But then how do you then percolate the decision making to who goes where uh, from that? You can't, again, just send everybody one place and all. So the the overall system is, and so the one I'm referring to has, has this little economic layer, but that's a learning system too. When you run auctions, those are learning systems. Those are when you run contracts, those are learning systems. They base they base how they make their decisions on past decisions and on past interactions. And if I go into a new city, people drive differently. The system, I, I should my avatar should know that or learn that quickly. And people have certain value valuations from that should be learned and should come into the way my avatar interacts. I'm just, I was just trying to emphasize that the uh, it's not just humans doing all the decision making; it's also avatars. But that's why we need the the theory of decision making that includes valuations, and then eventually the valuations have to be uh, okayed by the human. I want my avatar acting on my behalf, not wildly or weirdly. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. You work with Amazon. Uh, it, uh, yeah. Is, how, how do these ideas find their way into the real world? Very directly. But you know, I do a day a week. I'm an Amazon scholar. And so partly I just go in and it's for my own benefit. I, I see emerging problems. and. Uh, a lot of the things I'm talking about here was informed by experiences. Also, I spent time at, at Alibaba in China watching real merchant producer interactions. I've also spent time in a company that's changing the music business by creating a direct consumer or listener to producer 
to brand relationships and all that. I go into companies, I think like any classical engineer or scientist saying, what are the new problems that are emerging? And, um, and you, you see the kind of things I'm talking about. Logistics things you see, uncertainty quantification, you see planning, you see what if experiments, causal inference. You see all kinds of data flows of various kinds. You see the attempts to create market-based mechanisms. And not just Amazon, but just most company has a lot of this going on. And I just wish our academic world would be a little more tied and responsive to that. And uh, a little more aware of the problems that are emerging there. Can but yeah, I, there's no secrets that all of these companies have got, especially a company, Amazon, what I, why I chose Amazon was because they literally do the Indian problem. They're taking products made by anybody, anywhere, roughly, and they're sending it all the way to the doorstep of other people. And there's human preferences all along. There's scale issues. There, there's uncertainties. It's not just they're creating a website or a platform or a service on a web, which is fine, but then it's a little artificial. You have to monetize it with advertising and all that. And I'm kind of more enamored of situations where you monetize via people actually pay for things because they're getting value out of the overall process. And how do you make that fair? How do you make that efficient? What are the new issues that arise when you look at that? Yeah, I'm up against an hour, but I, I just want to ask on the music. My, my son is in the music business and is looking at applying AI to, to surfacing catalogs that have future life. Can you talk about the company that, that yeah. you're referring to and what it is that they're doing? Or that yeah, no, the for company is, is amazing. It, it's called United Masters, and I'd highly recommend having a look at it on the web. It has over 2 million musicians, mostly young people who are really good at making music, but who are never getting paid directly. You know, they were never really in a market for their music. They were like uploading songs that were getting streamed by other people who were selling subscriptions. So now... For example, the National Basketball Association is one of the brands that United Masters has signed a contract with. And so music being streamed on the NBA website is actually coming from these United Masters musicians who are often 16 or 18-year-olds, and they get paid when their music is, is streamed. And so it's a three-way market. You've got the musicians, and they uh, you know, create music. And also you have listeners, and so you now can, the data, it starts to inform you about who's listening to what. It's a recommendation system and a two-way market. But then you also have brands who, who want to be associated with certain kinds of music. And so it becomes a three-way kind of entity here, all informed by data analysis, all informed by adaptively connecting people. And it's actually a thriving economic entity. It's not the old record company business. It's different. It's, I think, revolutionizing the industry. The record companies were not acting in the favor of musicians, of young musicians especially. And so a new market needed to be created. And I think United Masters is the best example of this. I'm very, I'm on the board and I've been involved in this for about four or five years. And the CEO is Steve Stout, who's a legendary figure in the music world, the hip hop world especially. And uh, he's had the vision to create a company that really turned out to be a multi sided market. And I've been delighted to be involved in that. And I, I think it's a healthy thing. So it's AI in the sense that it's networks and it's data and it's preferences and it's all this, all the stuff we've been talking about. But it's also AI that has created new jobs. Roughly okay. speaking, you have 2 million people who've got some form of a job. And some of these jobs are not a billion dollar salary to make your music, but it's maybe a hundred thousand dollar. And if you do that over 2 million people, you've added a lot to social value. So I think that's a vision of AI or whatever you call it that I really want to, to push. Wow. That's fascinating. And yeah, I will look into that. The incentive on the end users and is that it's, it's cheaper than streaming than the, the traditional streaming services or yeah you know, what's the incentive an end user can choose any number of places to listen to music okay 
The advantage here is that the music that United Masters produces and streams, you have a real connection between the musician that made it and the people that are listening to it. And the, the musician can actually know how many people listen to my music in each city in the United States. That becomes data for them. And, and they could now discover, for example, that they're popular in Dayton, Ohio. 10,000 people listened to their music last week. And they can then offer the venue owners in Dayton, Ohio to come give a show there. The venue owners say, yeah, you're popular. And moreover, we know who's listening to you. Or we can ping them, say, hey, so-and-so is coming to town. And they'll show up at the venue. So everybody's happy. The venue owner, the people get to see their favorite young, young musician that no one ever knew about. But they like this person. And then the musician's happy because they get to go and maybe make $20,000. So that triad of kind of data flow allows a market to emerge. And then you can have things like, I give a go to this show and I, uh, I, I say, look, I can broadcast to the people who listen to me. If you want me to come give a, a, a play your daughter's wedding, uh, I'll do it. That's $10,000, uh, whatever. That's what markets do. They create new possibilities when you start to actually link the people who are making the music to the people that are listening to the music. And so the listeners are, you know, it's probably the third leg in this is a, a certain sense, but they get more direct access. You can also imagine a version of this. I think as it goes forward, you'll imagine a version where there's a web presence of the artist where they go and they're, they could buy merchandise. They could wear a cap with their favorite musician. And it's not like just, Beyonce or the Beatles, it's musician X who lives in inner city Baltimore, who's really good. And I love that musician. I want to wear a cap right now. I can't do that. Yeah. But if I could do that, that would be an economic value to me as a cap wearer and certainly the musician who would get the money for it. And if you do that at scale, this starts to feel like a really powerful use of new data and technology and networking. And this is not, a, you know, this is no wildly new vision. Sometimes this is called the creator economy. And you don't see that terminology used much in academic circles, but you do see it even, you do see it nowadays in Silicon Valley. And I think it's real. I think people yeah. do create, they want to create, and they want to be connected. They get value out of the things they create uh, via all of our technology and not just yeah. hand it over to the big companies to be sold on their behalf. Yeah, except what I don't understand and what you've just described is how that's different from Spotify or somebody like Spotify. I'm not saying there can't be an intermediate system that collects things and sends them on. But, and I don't know that much about the Spotify business model, exactly how it's done and all that. But if I'm a musician, I just blindly put my songs up there on the web and Spotify streams them. Okay, I don't have any clue who's listening to them. I can't monetize that. Okay, and uh, and I'm not in a market where my songs could be played by Pepsi Cola because uh, and I'm connected directly to them. That there's a bidding right. process where the artists are made available. There, the, that level of economic integration is not present in the Spotify model. If I understand correctly, Spotify is really more of a subscription model. So they're making a fair amount of money by people just throwing, giving them money to listen to songs. And then Spotify, I think, sends some money back to musicians, but that's not really the business model. They're not incentivized to do that. I mean, they do it out of the goodness of their heart, or maybe they feel they have to do some. Some of these companies give money back to the influencers, partly because they just feel they have to, partly because they have to create a community of influencers. But it's not a very strong business model where the influencers themselves should have economic agency, economic visibility, should be directly connected to listeners, be directly connected to brands. And so that's not the Spotify model. Again, from a pure computer science point of view, bits are bits being streamed from one place to another, but that's not the right perspective. It should be an economics perspective. What does Who knows what and when and how can they monetize that individually, not via the company? Yeah. Wow, fascinating. Okay, I'd like to keep talking, but I've taken up too much of your time already. I hope I can have another conversation with you in a year or so. I enjoy talking to you as well. So hopefully yeah. uh, we'll talk again. Okay, thanks, Michael. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, 
having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. They support us, so let's support them.